imperialism, or really you could say this is American imperialism or an American empire, and you can see this goes along with chapter 20. So when it comes to imperialism, the United States, you could say, had a really long established tradition of expansion across the continent, but not necessarily a strong role in expansion outside of the continent. And so we're going to see by the 1890s, some Americans are now going to start urging America to really start building some sort of overseas empire. But how to do this is really argued in different ways. Some wanted to follow like the European model of imperialism being like you acquire different colonial possessions and you basically exploit them for everything they're worth. And other Americans wanted more of like a less formal empire where they were more interested in like influencing those abroad and ensuring like an extensive trade network and more of an investment that's not military. Um, others, of course, then want like a cultural expansion, which would be ideas, institutions, religions. Well, we're going to have a bunch of different reasons for imperialism. And we're going to look at well, three different main topics. And the first is going to be ideological and religious reasons. And there's actually four subcategories just looking at ideological and religious reasons. So the first of these four would be social Darwinism. And we've talked about social Darwinism before, but this is on a much larger scale, basically the United States competing against other nations, especially European nations, that were expanding into like Asia and Africa, especially like in the 1880s and 1890s. And so it's very much survival of the fittest. If America wants to prove that we are the fittest country, like we have to compete like the Europeans are and have our own colonial possessions. And that was the idea behind one of the ideological arguments. The second ideological argument is basically the belief in racial inequality. So basically racism. Um, this was all about American like industrial progress and saying that America was the most industrialized country in the world that had the Midas military strength and um, the best political system. And all of this proved supposedly Anglo-Saxon superiority over all other races. And so therefore, if Anglo-Saxons are supposed to be, you know, the best race, then it was their responsibility to extend the blessings of their rule to people that were less fortunate. And so this is basically the idea of the so-called, in quotes, white man's burden. So it's the white man's burden. So it's racist reasons for taking over other nations because, oh, it's the white man's burden that we're the best. So we have to bestow our ideas and our strength and bring our blessings to those less fortunate. Uh, the third ideological reason is basically ideals of masculinity. It's the most masculine course. It's the manly course to forcefully expand. And then the fourth one is looking at more that religious ideology that American missionaries basically wanted to evangelize the world, of course, with a Protestant tradition and everything, uh, generally speaking. And so they wanted that religious transformation abroad. Now, the reason you can tie this into ideological as well is a lot of times that religious transformation resembled a cultural conversion and it promoted things like trade and developing business interests so you see that economic reasoning and encouraging westernization so it wasn't just purely religious which brings us to the strategic concern so this is the second big um, idea pushing expansion at this time period 
The thing is, if you look at forces of history and geography, the United States is, it has two oceans that it touches, the Atlantic and the Pacific. And there's this wor worry or concern that America needed to do more to protect its borders. And so this is really gonna push for like a larger Navy specifically to protect its borders. Um, a large Navy policy really is popular amongst imperialists at this time. A lot of the origins for it laid in about like 1881 when Congress established the Naval Advisory Board and they um, would go on to successfully lobby for larger naval appropriations. And so we're gonna see the United States is going to possess a formidable Navy that a lot of the expansionists wanted. Now this is a little bit twofold because it's one hand, the strategic concern of expanding abroad on some level is just wanting to have a Navy but the thing is, if you have a large Navy, you need to have strategic bases and coaling stations to basically help your Navy. And so that's where we get the strategy kind of involved in all of this. And then we have economic reasons. Uh, many Americans were pushing for imperialism because of these economic reasons. Um, one reason for a strong Navy, for instance, so this kind of ties into some of the strategic concerns and like the ideological concerns. So one reason for a strong Navy was basically to protect America's international trade. The thing is, even if you weren't for expanding out militarily at this time, basically all Americans were wanting economic expansion through foreign trade. Um, so it was more of a commercial goal more than colonial goal. Uh, the thing is, we're seeing that the United States had long fostered American trade in different places like Latin America and East Asia. And we do see exports from America, especially like manufactured exported goods, are going to grow about nine fold just between 1865 and 1900. But even with selling so many items, because keep in mind when you're looking at economics, very simple thing, you want to be selling more than you're buying because then you're making money. Uh, but even with that huge increase, there had been periodic depressions during this time period. Remember, we've looked at those a couple of times. And this fed a lot of fears about like overproduction and um the fact that there had been, you know, massive unemployment during a lot of these periodic depressions and social unrest comes along with that because you see like uh, labor unions fighting for, you know, higher wages and things like that. And so all of this together basically combined and provided social and political arguments for economic relief through foreign trade. Um, especially like when you get to the depression in the 1890s, we're going to see a lot of Americans interest in foreign trade almost becomes like obsessive. And so we see a lot of systematic government efforts during this time period to promote trade. And it, it really does seem necessary to people to promote trade that aggressively because of these, you know, depressions in the economy and the social unrest and everything that comes along with it. So looking at all of these reasons for imperialism at this time, this is an opinion question. What do you think was the strongest in America at this time?